Well, good morning. I have quite a few announcements to make this morning, so this is going to be interesting, and it would be a miracle if I remember them all, so just bear with me. Um, well, first thing this morning, I want to welcome guests. If you are a guest here this morning, you are very much welcome here at New Hope, and I uh, would like you to fill out, if you could, a Connect card and put it in the offering so that we would know you were here, uh, so we can not harass you, but um, just let you know what happened here during the rest of the week here at church, and not just here on Sundays, because a lot goes on on this campus through the whole week. So if you do that, we'd really appreciate it. Also, it was Veterans Day yesterday. I would like to acknowledge all of our veterans that we have in the sanctuary. If you'd like to stand, please. We thank you very much for your service. The Hubbard Borough Tournament goes on every single year um, for the last 13 years, I think, and um, we are very much involved in that. And uh, Mike Demanuel just told me this morning that they had a record um, fundraiser on Friday, so that is exceptional. They raised over $50,000, which is the first time ever. So. Um, also, this time of year, it's Angel Tree. Now, there's no good way to do this, so we're just going to try and figure out how to get this done. But it is, it is going to be an object lesson, a biblical object lesson this morning, because we have two trees. One says 1045, the other says 915. For the purposes of this service, this is the forbidden tree. <laughs> so think back to Genesis, Adam and Eve... The forbidden tree for this service. This is your tree. You can eat as much of this as you want. <laughs> All of it, preferably, yeah. The other thing about these trees is there is pink on one side, blue on the other, that traditionally is boys and girls. Down the middle, there is a ribbon that separates boys and girls. <laughs> so if you want boys, that side. If you want girls, this side. And we're going to have everybody come up and do this while I'm doing the rest of the announcements, otherwise we'll be here all day. So remember, Adam and Eve, forbidden tree, good tree to eat from. So we'll see how many lessons we learned from that. So please, at any time I'm doing the announcements, please come up and feel free to get angels from the angel tree. But keep listening because there's lots of other announcements. Okay. <clears throat> while we're doing that... I'm going to talk a little bit about Angel Tree. Angel Tree is something that we participate in every single year, and it's something that all of you generously give to, um, and it connects basically incarcerated parents with their children. And sometimes this is the only contact or connection that they get in the year, so it's a very, very important thing to do. Uh, and we're going to watch a, a video about this, just so you have a better idea if you're not familiar with it. I wish. And I wish I could see my dad. I wish my family could be together for Christmas. I wish I had a dolly. A new dress. A new dress. A soccer ball. I wish I could have my mom. I wish my dad could play catch with me. 2.7 million children have a simple wish this Christmas. To feel special. To feel remembered. To feel loved by a parent who's far away. You can help. It starts with a gift. A simple present from their parent reminding them they are loved and not forgotten. And the gift of knowing the love and support of their Heavenly Father. This calls for believers to take action. So while mothers and fathers are behind bars, kids are left behind. Families torn apart. This calls for churches across America to rise up and deliver gifts to children on behalf of parents in prison. You and your church become the hands and feet of Jesus. You deliver God's love and bring hope to those who need it most. Families are restored. Children find joy. Parents experience God's grace. It starts with a gift. Since in 1982, Angel Tree, with the help of thousands of churches across the country, has reached more than 9 million kids. With a gift, the gospel, and a message from their incarcerated parent. These 2.7 million kids need to feel their parents' love this Christmas 
and they need to know Jesus loves them, starting with the ones right here in your community. It's simple. It calls believers to put their faith into action. It inspires you and your family to live out the real meaning of Christmas. You bless the child of a prisoner with a gift and the good news of Jesus Christ. Every child has a story. Every child has a wish. Every child deserves a chance. It starts with a gift. It starts with you. This Christmas, change the life of a child forever. Okay, so the way this works is you take a label, a, a gift tag, and uh, you go out and buy a gift that has a $25 value. That might not be what exactly you paid for it, but it needs to be a value of about $25 so that if there's multiple gifts coming from different people for different members of the family, then it's an even kind of thing. There isn't one gift that's particularly more expensive than the other. So if you see a $50 thing and it's on sale for half price and it's $25, that's not what we're looking for. It's the value of $25 just to keep it fair and even in, within families. So you take a gift tag and then you write your name and phone number on the little slip of paper on the back, take that off, and then pass it to the center aisle. So those in the center, I'm afraid you're going to have a job today is just to hold on to some pieces of paper. And we will collect those um, at the time we do the offering. But do, do not put them in the offering bag, but just pass them to the center and then we will collect them separately for that. Please do not leave with that little piece of paper attached because otherwise we lose track of the angel. Hmm? Please. Please do not leave with that piece of paper. So, um, What else do I need to say about this? Uh, there's still some on the tree if anyone wants them. Normally they're gone by now. <laughs> um, this is a very good thing. You know, Jesus said take care of widows and orphans and honestly when you have um, a member of your family incarcerated, it is about as close as you can get to that without actually being a widow and an orphan, So, because they are very, very absent. And this is a great way to connect kids to parents or parents to kids uh, at Christmas time. So thank you for all the times you've done this before, and thank you for those that are doing it this year. Um, there is a church-wide meeting. <coughs> excuse me. There's a church-wide meeting on... <coughs> get my voice back. Thank you. December 3rd. Um, that is at 12.30, so it'll be after the third service here in the sanctuary. <clears throat> this church meeting, the, we'll be talking about the proposed budget for next year. Uh, that'll be finalized in the coming couple of weeks by the board. Uh, there will also be discussion about the um, building project. That'll be more informational, where we're at, what we're doing, that kind of thing. So uh, that'll give you an update on that. Uh, we'll also give you a financial update of where we're at year to date. And then um, there'll be potential elder recommendations. Uh, for the board next year, and there will also be an update on mission giving. And mission giving, as you know, is a very important part of New Hope, <clears throat> and we strive to give over 20% of what we bring in to outside missions and causes. <clears throat> Today is also Volunteer Appreciation Day, so if you have volunteered at all in any capacity, whether it's doing events like weddings, funerals, uh, if you've worked in Sunday school or youth groups, if you've worked as an elder or an usher, emptying trash, fixing things, anything in between, uh, then we really appreciate what you do as a volunteer. Volunteers make this church go, and without volunteers, it makes it very difficult to do anything. It's basically like having an engine with no gas. So we could put together as much as we want here, but if we don't have volunteers, things don't happen very easily. So um, please um, know that we do appreciate you, and there is a gift for you in the pavilion at the tables. Uh, it is a 16-month pocket calendar. It's so you can keep track of all the volunteer things that you are doing. And so uh, there's also some pens there as well. So please feel free to go out there, get, take one of those, uh, and just know that we really, really do appreciate everything that you do. Uh, there is a parent meeting today at 12.30 for youth. Anyone involved whose kids are involved in the youth, that's high school and junior high. That'll be in the bridge right after third service. Chris will be outlining all the different things that you need to know, things like the calendar for the rest of the year, the camps that are coming up, and all the forms that need to be filled out uh, associated with that. So if you have a teen that's in youth, or you, have, or you know a teen that you think would benefit from youth, uh, then please go to that meeting, find out more information about that. <clears throat> 
Speaking of youth, there is a winter camp coming up in January 19th through 21st. That is up at Hume. If you're interested in signing up your team for that, then um, uh, you can go online. I think the enrollment is online right now. It's $200, uh, or see Chris if you want more information about it, or Brittany when she gets back. Um, there is also a winter camp for fourth through sixth graders. That's the junior camp, not junior high, but junior camp. It's fourth through sixth graders, and that's up at Heartland. That'll be the first weekend in February. So if you have kids that are interested in going to that, let Jennifer know in the kids' building, or let me know, and we'll get you some information about that. Uh, that's usually a very good trip. We did it for the first time last year. And that one is $100. Um, tonight, Sunday evening service. So every, every Sunday night now, we have a Sunday evening service. It's at 6 p.m. in the bridge. Tonight is a particularly important one from my perspective because I've been doing the Loving Our Neighbors initiative around here. And this is an event, an event that we're holding that is put on by Love Inc. and ESA. And they will be um, sort of outlining all the different things that we can be doing in the holidays to love our neighbors, to connect with neighbors, um, and just be able to share the, the good news of Jesus Christ during the time of his birth. So it'll be some practical tips as well as just some uh, talk about why it's important uh, to do these things. Uh, so come along to that at 6 p.m. There'll be refreshments and food. So uh, it'll be a good evening, and we'd appreciate any support that we could get for that initiative tonight at 6 p.m. in the bridge. Um, there was an impromptu Mexico mission trip that not many people knew about. So it was brought to our attention that the missionary that we worked with down in Mexico, their roof was broken and needed some repair. So Teddy, Steve Drake, and, and Brittany went down there with some college kids and took care of it, basically. The last couple of days, they worked very hard. They put the new roof on. Everything looks good. They worked. They worked very, very hard and earned all the tacos they ate, so, um, so we're okay with that. So they, they'll be heading, I think they're heading back today, so we really appreciate their availability to do that uh, at short notice and just to help out with that family that lives down there. Um, Thanksgiving feast for prime time. So 55 and older, there is a feast on Tuesday for Thanksgiving. This is the annual event, the biggest one on the calendar for, for prime timers. That will be in the bridge at what time? Sorry, Noon. Uh, we will be catering some turkey, ham, potatoes, and then just bring your favorite, well, it's written in the bulletin, but bring your favorite side dishes. Um, and just come along and have some fun. Fellowship with people at a time when we're starting the holidays. Um, always a good time for everybody involved. Um, also, there is the Ladies' Ornament Exchange. That is on November 27th. That is always a popular event, so get tickets today. It's out in the pavilion, $5 a ticket. Um, that will be country Christmas theme. The Gilly Girls will be... Do you have a picture? No. The Gilly Girls will be uh, performing at that, at that evening event. Um, if anyone that saw them at the Prime Timers Luncheon, they are very, very good. They're two sets of twins from the same family, very talented musicians. Um, Awesome to watch. So um, come along to that for the ladies on November 27th. And also there is a Bible study that Tim is leading, Sharing Faith at Christmas. And that's kind of how to put together a short testimony that you can share with people at Christmas time um, and how to do that, how to share your faith. Uh, it's a very challenging thing sometimes to do that. So it's just a three-week study, and there is a sign-up sheet somewhere. Oh, it's right there. So that'll be going around for, if you could sign up for that so we make sure we have enough room, so we need to figure out which room we're going to do it in, so um, we already had a lot of people. Is this Okay, <laughs> it sort of seems to get loud and quiet, loud and quiet. Um, so sign up if you'd like to do that. That starts November 29th, and it is at 7 o'clock in the evening on Wednesday nights, and ends on December 13th. Um, Neonan Junior High School, we've had the board up for quite some time, all the kids that needed sponsorship for Neonan Village in the Ivory Coast have now been sponsored, so... Thank you, everybody that sponsored those kids. If you did sponsor and you have not heard anything yet, please let Shelley know and she will get information to you about that. Uh, also, payment, if you have not paid yet, payment is due um, right, right about now. So, uh, also, I just wanted to thank everybody on behalf of Chris and myself who came to the ordination service last week uh, or who gave cards or just just congratulated us, and we really appreciate all the support. It was a very um, moving ceremony for both of us, and it was, it was really well supported, and we just really appreciate 
all the support that we both get from all of you all the time. And um, it's just, it's, it's awesome. So prayer requests. Uh, firstly, I just want to say, keep in your prayers uh, the Texas church uh, that had such a tragedy last weekend. Uh, um, as we were here in the sanctuary last week, uh, the shooting over in the Texas church. So we just keep them in your prayers. And it's just, uh, not just the families that lost people, but also those that were there. I mean, it's a very traumatic experience to go through um, for all those that witnessed it also. Um, also, Heidi Stoll is having surgery tomorrow, so keep her in your prayers. Uh, and surgeries last week, there was Deborah Glunz and um, Jennifer Hernandez both had surgery, so keep them in your prayers for recovery. Uh, and Milt Pierce, he needs prayers as he's going through chemo, and, you know, it's, it's very rough. So just keep him in your prayers as well um, as he recovers from chemotherapy and uh, all, all that's associated with that. Um, okay, at this time I'd like to ask our ushers to come forward. If you have pieces of paper, please pass them to the middle. So the ushers will come by with the offering bag, uh, and then right after that we'll come and get the pieces of paper down the center of the aisle for Angel Tree. Okay, please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're just grateful to be able to be here today, to be able to worship openly, pray openly, to be able to speak openly and share our opinions. And we can do this because of the freedom we enjoy as a nation. And we enjoy this freedom because of those that went before us. We just pray for all veterans, whether in the past and current. We pray for all men and women in uniform, whether they're protecting the city, this nation, whether they're overseas, because they're the ones that stand in the gap between us and those that wish to do evil. So we pray for their protection from you. Lord, we pray for the families of military personnel who make such a big sacrifice as well. Veterans always make a sacrifice, and families also do. So we just pray for them when they are in times of stress or hardship, that they will lean on you and find strength. We pray for those on the prayer list today, and those that were not mentioned, but are in the hearts of those here present today. Uh, we pray for those that were affected by the Texas church um, shooting last weekend. Pray for the families of those that were lost. We pray for those that are recovering and those that were there and that they can find ways to, to find some sense in all this, if there even is any. We pray all this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Am I on? <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Well, we're going to talk today uh, about volunteerism a little bit because this is Volunteer Appreciation Sunday. And to do that, I'm going to have to do something that I was advised many years ago by my wife not to do. She said I shouldn't get too wrapped up in sports metaphors or sports stories or stuff like that because a lot of the ladies and, and some of the other guys that are not sports fans might go to sleep on me. Well, I'm going to try not to put you to sleep. I'm going to violate her advice, but I'm going to ask you sports or non-sports fans to kind of bear with me because the metaphor or euphemism I'm going to use here I think is one you can, you can understand okay. Now, when I first wrote this line, I had to go back and do some math. 45 years ago, the Miami Dolphins embarked on an incredible and unparalleled season in football. I had to go back and, and double check to make sure it was really 45 years ago, because I'm not supposed to have memories that are 45 years old. <laughs> but I remember that season. The Dolphins went through a 14-0 regular season, and they went 3-0 through the playoffs, including the Super Bowl. And no other team in the history of the NFL has ever matched that perfect season. Which, of course, the Dolphins and their fans are quick to point out as soon as somebody gets to 6 or 7-0 and 0 every year. And that is a thumb in the eye to many of us who are Chicago Bears fans or New England Patriots fans who missed it by that much. But no team has ever duplicated it. So the Dolphins stand alone. Now, sports enthusiasts will... <laughs> all have their own opinion about who was the greatest football team of all times. But a 1972 Dolphin probably put it the most succinctly when he said, 
Uh, perfection has a way of shutting people's mouths. Yeah, well, that's what keeps us Bears fans and the Patriots fans quiet every year. <laughs> Washington Redskins coach George Allen, on his way to the Super Bowl that year, was asked to comment on that stellar defense that Miami had. And he said, I can't recall any of their names, but they are a matter of great concern to us. Y'all remember what the nickname of that defense was? The no-name defense? You remember that? Is there anybody in here that's 55 or older remembers that game? <laughs> they did great. But you know what made that team special was not the handful of superstars that they had. It was the dedication of every single member of the team and their willingness to execute their job at their position to the best of their ability. And something happens, something special happens whenever people on the team play their position. The whole becomes greater than the individual parts. Now, no doubt Miami had some great players that year. But there have been plenty of other teams since then who've had better personnel, uh, more Pro Bowl players, more big superstars, maybe even more Hall of Famers, and yet no team has reached the level of achievement they did that year. What do you suppose would have happened if three members of that offense decided that their role wasn't really all that important? They get in the huddle and Bob Greasy calls a sweep to the right with Mercury Morris running the ball, two of their superstars. But then when the ball's hiked, Larry Little, Jim Langer, and Norm Evans decided that their blocking role wasn't really all that critical to the play. And they just stood there. I don't know if sacrificing my body is worth three yards. And so they, they don't participate. After all, they're just going to tackle him a little bit down the field anyway. You think that mindset is what took him to the Super Bowl? Anybody? No. I don't think so. What if nine different guys decided that their true position, the one they should be playing, was running back? If I don't play running back, then it's not important. Guards never make sports center. Ah, forget it. That mindset, get them to the Super Bowl? No. The world of sports isn't the only place where positional confusion can take place. It happens everywhere. I'm sure it's happened to you on the job. It happens here at church. The positions and the roles in God's kingdom are more varied and they're more critical than any game, any day, anywhere. And the church is full of people who are uniquely gifted for the position that God has called them to play in church. So when God calls your name to send you into the game, chances are you might be able to say to yourself, you know, with God's help, I think I might be able to do that. I might be able to. And that role that you're called to doesn't have to be some uh, off-the-charts, miraculous, inherently super-spiritual role. But don't kid yourself. God's call is just as certain to all positions on his roster. My experience is that God will often call you to use a gift he's given you that you may or may not even recognize he often calls you to use a gift or skill that so far you haven't practiced using in the world. For example, and I'll, I'll speak a little bit more of this in a, in, in a moment, but my first real foray into volunteerism was as a missionary in a choir. But my biggest contribution had nothing to do with being able to sing. Because later it led me doing things like hanging glass in a window of a door or carrying buckets of concrete up three, stair, or three flights of stairs so we could put in a floor in a church that was being built. Being called by God to serve in the kingdom encompasses a lot more than just in teaching Sunday school or singing on the praise team or being a missionary. The possibilities are actually endless. There's always some, some vision that God has provided in the church. There's always some need and some people think that some of the smaller areas are trivial or unimportant. But I'm, I'm going to tell you, that is not true. It couldn't be further from the truth. Well, I just serve cookies in the reception line. 
Well, I want to tell you something. You don't just do anything. That's given back to the Lord. It's all important. All of hell is dead set against keeping you from the truth about how valuable your contribution is in God's kingdom. The truth is you have an opportunity to impact eternity. Yes, each one of you sitting out here right now have an opportunity to impact eternity. And you probably have an opportunity to do it in ways you hadn't even considered. So don't fall for the lie that your contribution is unimportant. There's an interesting look on this subject in Scripture that shows just how significant it is when volunteers pull together, they get in the game, and they begin to work for the greater good of the kingdom. It's found in Acts chapter 6, verses 1 to 7, and I'm sure most of us have probably heard this before. Now, in the days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, it isn't right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and of Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient of the faith. Now, we pastors like to point to that and say, and deacons were born. But deacons are just servants in the church. Again, verse 7 tells us, and the word of God continued to increase, or it continued to spread. Why? Did they preach better now? Or was it because they started singing the songs that I like? No, it was because people did what they were called by God to do. God's plan was executed because spectators became players. People got off the, the bench and got out onto the field and gave what they had. They took those abilities that God had given them and they used them for eternal purposes. The number of disciples multiplied greatly. They're not referring to the 12. They're referring to believers in general. They multiplied greatly. Lost people came to faith because believers stepped up, got in the game. Souls went to heaven because believers made and served cookies in a reception line. Isn't God amazing? Amen. Yes. Think of how we would miss out, even here in our own little church, if believers didn't use their gifts here. What would happen if we all assumed our abilities were not important to the kingdom? What if, uh, what if Milo and Randy and Micah and Tim and the praise band back here and our praise singers all decided that Eh, I, just, I just play an instrument or I just sing. That's not really all that valuable to the kingdom. What if our, our crew of greeters and ushers out there said, well, I just like welcoming the people to church, but that's not really important. How about if all the sound and video volunteers that work back there in the booth is, I just do creative video stuff and make sure we can all hear the speaker. That's not that important. I beg to differ. <laughs> But what if the children's church worker said the same thing? I love kids, but how can that really be valuable to God's kingdom? You get the point? Friends, the list goes on and on. This church only has great potential for future ministry because we stand on the strong shoulders of volunteers responding to God's call on their lives. God's people coming together for one common purpose, and that is to spread his word, his gospel, to the rest of the world. And here's something I found out over the years. When people become servants and they find their spiritual gift, God leads them to a ministry that they're passionate about. Or he leads them to a ministry and lights the passion for them. Finding your position won't necessarily involve going on some 
super ministry-seeking safari, it will likely mean just rolling up your sleeves and diving into service until suddenly that flame of passion roars to life. And it's a most incredibly fascinating thing to watch happen because God uses different ways to lead different people to their service of passion. First, in finding their position, finding their ministry. And I believe one of the small groups is even doing a study on finding your spiritual gift. And that sounds like something that's really hard to do. I, let me just encourage you. It's not hard to do, but you have to have your eyes open. And sometimes you might be an accountant. Your spiritual gift is going to have nothing to do with numbers. It might be something totally different. One thing he'll do, though, is he'll make your heart beat faster about some area of ministry. I happen to be the pastor of care ministries here, but there are a lot of uh, a people lovers here that I really don't have a whole lot of interaction with. I don't have to go find those people and fire them up to do their ministry. They have a spiritual igniter inside them. The Holy Spirit ha has given them their love for people. I look at people in the Helping Hands ministry or the Heart to Heart ministries. There are probably many of you right now out there who have participated in or benefited from those ministries. People who serve the ill or the injured or the discouraged or they're post-surgical or had a baby. But for some reason or another, they need someone to just kind of reach out and love them up a little bit. And these people do that. And they don't need me to, to do it. They don't complain on their day off about being busy taking meals to somebody who's sick or writing cards or visiting people who they may not even recognize because they go to the third service. <laughs> But they do it because they love people and they love doing what God has called them to do. They don't complain and they say things like, oh yeah, we get to do that. We like doing that. We like to bring food and clothing or pray with people who've fallen on hard times or whatever it is. And I could go from ministry to ministry to ministry. And there are people like that. Secondly, you're, you're more open to serving when there's a current need. And you might look and say, oh, well, pastor, it looks like every, everything's taken. No, there's always a need. There's always a need that can be filled. I didn't get involved in volunteer ministry because I was passionate about it. In fact, at that time in my life, I wasn't passionate about much of anything unless it had to do with a softball or it was one of the courses I was taking from Moody Bible Institute. I jumped into volunteer ministry and cautiously... <laughs> Because I was asked to. Well, okay, really, I was pressured to. <laughs> but there was a need. Our choir was going to send a ministry team uh, first to the Philippines. Turned out it was going to go to, to Russia and Ukraine. And my choir director came to me and says, I need your voice to anchor the tenor, uh, the bass section. And I, I said, well, you know, I, when it was the Philippines, I said, I really, ha I don't have much interest in going to the Philippines. And he says, well, okay, well, but we're not going to go. We're going to go the, to Russia instead. Oh, well, let me reconsider. I always wanted to go to Russia. I remembered the Cold War, because I'm old enough to remember the Cold War. And I remembered those goose-stepping guys in Red Square. And I was, for some reason, I was always fascinated about going to see Russia. So I finally agreed to go. But I made it clear I was going as a, a, a tourist singer. I, I wasn't really going to do anything that had to do with ministry. So it wasn't passion at first. It was need and curiosity. But I have to tell you, those of you who know me know that before that two-week period was over, God took a blowtorch and lighted some passion in my life. Passion for the people of Ukraine and Russia. melted my heart for them and for the work that he was doing over there. And so after that first trip, I made 25 more. And I didn't get to go over there and preach. I wasn't a preacher. That's something that he had me do over there, sometimes 22 or 23 times a week. He had me carry buckets of concrete up three flights of stairs so he could put a floor in. 
I put glass in a church, a three-story church, and I set glass. I'd never done any of that stuff before, but he said, you can do it. I know you can because I gifted you to be able to do that. You're smart enough to figure it out. And so he used me, and he used me again and again and again and again. Now, I haven't been there in seven years, and my heart longs to go back because of the passion that he put there, too. So, <laughs> incidentally, again, that was an area of ministry I, I really had no clue I was ever going to be involved in. Actually, when I, when I started pastoring, preaching and talking to people about God was never something I was going to do. I was always the number two guy who was making it possible for somebody else to do what they were doing. Now, that wasn't, that wasn't good enough for him. He did that. He also had me leave staff here in 2006 and had me pastor another church here in town for almost 10 years. I'm telling you, God has something for you to do. Whether it's doing that or whether it's baking cookies and serving them in a line, it's important to him that we do what we do. The, the key is here, we can't, we can't stay on the sidelines friends. We can't remain on the sidelines and be healthy by being a spectator. And we see this again like in football. Every week on Sunday, hundreds of thousands of people fill 32 stadiums. Well, there's only 16 stadiums, 32 teams. They fill these stadiums up and watch a few dozen guys down on the field getting all the exercise that those hundreds of thousands of people in the stands actually need. <laughs> Now, volunteers have a life. I know that. It, it was something that, a realization that came to me early on when I got involved in ministry. Because here I was getting paid to, to, to be in ministry, and yet asking so much of the volunteers to come in and do these things, and sometimes being frustrated because there weren't enough bodies to fill the positions and stuff like that. And actually, it was my wife that pointed out, says, well, they have, they have lives, too. They've got jobs, they've got spouses, they've got kids, they've got bills to pay and lawns to mow and all that stuff. Plus be involved in ministry. So I realized that what I was doing was asking people to sacrifice. When a volunteer steps onto the field and decides to discover their gift and begin to use them. When they work hard all day and then drive straight home or straight from work to the church... Sometimes they miss dinner, they miss their download time. Something happens in here. When they come to serve and they show up to work with kids or with teenagers or work in the nursery or set up chairs and tables or, or clean up after somebody else's event. They show up to be an usher or a greeter or to serve coffee, to, to play in the band or to sing up here. They find themselves looking around and hopefully thinking, Maybe, maybe my contribution here is important. I want to affirm you today. It's volunteer appreciation. I want to affirm you. Yes, whatever contribution it is you are making, you're making it to the Lord, and it is important to him. I guess what I want to do today is affirm the dignity, if you will, of volunteers. There's something inherently uh, holy. Holy about volunteerism, about giving back to the Lord. You're not giving back, by the way, to New Hope. We benefit from your giving. You're giving back to the Lord. What do you think Jesus might say to a volunteer? Well, the first thing I think he might say is, what you do really matters for all eternity. I saw him here just a little bit ago, but about a month ago, a young man here in our congregation, Rick Cardozo, is one of our young guys who grew up in this church. He grew up in the youth group. He had his first opportunity to deliver a sermon, a message, to an adult audience in our Sunday evening service just about a month, eve, a month ago. Rick has proved to be a real student of the Word, and he, he has a heart to preach. Many, many of you who are here today prayed for Rick during his years here at New Hope in our youth group. Some of you probably helped him, at least by example, by serving him and the other youth that were here at the time, 
or maybe you worked around or worked beside them in some ministry here on the campus. Or you might have led them on some of their mission trips during spring break. Or maybe you just donated to the mission trip. Now the reviews, if you want to call them that, are that Rick's first sermon clearly indicate the young man sure does have a, a call on his life to preach the word. Your prayers and encouragement, those examples of service that you've, you've been before him, probably didn't cost you much. Yeah, you might spend $25 on, a, on an angel tree gift. You may never know what that does to the child who receives it or what it does on behalf of the parent that is giving the gift through you. But I can tell you it may have eternal impact. What you do matters for all eternity. Now, there is something else that I think Jesus would say to a volunteer, and it's going to take me a little bit. I'll have to, have to go around the long way around the barn to get you to it, but I'll get it to you. But how many of you have ever gone into prison ministry, gone behind the walls of prison? Yeah, yeah, I, I've gone there. And I have a great deal of admiration for other people that do, especially for people who do it time and time and time again. We know Janice does that. Guy that lives across the street from me over here goes every week. Every week he goes behind prison walls. The hours of preparation, the time to travel, the time actually doing the ministry, all that stuff adds up. Next Sunday, as a church family, we're going to recognize someone who does that, and hopefully honor him a little bit. More importantly, we're going to come alongside him. Tim Kepler has a ministry that goes behind prison walls. And he's got a need in that ministry. And we're going to come alongside him next week as a church family, hopefully to help meet that need. But you guys know Tim's ministry up here. Several times a month, he helps us in leading our worship and our praise. He offers his gifts back to the Lord. And he does it without complaint. We all get to enjoy his sacrificial gift. At least I sure enjoy it. I love to hear that man sing. But what a thrill it is to be able to sing along with him in praising God. And we probably have no idea what it costs him in research time, rehearsal time, travel time, all that stuff to prepare himself to volunteer on Sundays. Micah might know. Mila knows. Those that work with him know. But what would happen if the person that shared Christ with him when he was incarcerated decided that what he was doing was not all that important? Or what if he asked himself the question that Jesus might ask a, a, a servant? I'm not crazy, am I? <laughs> Some people I work with at my real job think I'm crazy. They know how hard and long I work for the Lord going into prisons. Even some of my family members think I'm crazy. I'm not crazy, am I? Huh. You ever have a moment like that? When you've used your gifts until you're just about tapped out, exhausted? See, anybody who takes God seriously, who loves the church, and when I say loves the church, I mean loves the people, not the buildings. That's brick and mortar and plaster and whatever else they make buildings out of. The church is the people. The people who love the church or they care about lost people. Anyone who gives themselves up for the cause of Christ knows what it's like to come home late at night from a ministry event where they gave all they had. Those of you who work in VBS, you've been there. Children's musicals, church barbecues, fireworks booths, Work days, people come out and volunteer and give of themselves for these things. They know what it's like to get home at 1 o'clock in the morning after cleaning up a, uh, or tearing down after an event that went late. They know what it's like when things break down in a ministry. It's just hard. You volunteers have jobs and families and pressures of life and all that. And on top of it, carry a full load here at church. 
Well, maybe you, maybe you serve somewhere else. Maybe you serve at Salvation Army or someplace like that, Marjorie Mason Center. You have service somewhere where you're serving the Lord. You know what it's like. We've been through big seasons around here as a church before where there's intensity and focus and all those things. And I'm sure God's got a lot more things on our agenda to go in the days and months ahead. We're going to need all hands on deck. I want you to picture this just for a moment now. And picture yourself that you're in a battle. And you are. If you're a believer, you're in a battle against evil. Against Satan. Who wants to keep people from being with the Lord. He wants to keep them for themselves. He wants to keep people out of eternity. Well, picture yourself then on a battleship. And understand that there are no spectators on a battleship. Because if you lose, y'all lose. Y'all go down. Will it be easy, your service? I don't know. I'm not going to insult you by asking you to do something easy. I'm going to ask, want you to, I want you to drive home and ask yourself, am I crazy? Now, some of you might answer, yes, you are crazy. 1 Corinthians chapter, or chapter 15, verse 58 says this, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Jesus used to tell his followers, the Father who sees in secret will richly reward you. What's he saying? He's saying, you're not crazy. He said to his followers, I tell you, no one who has left houses or land or mother or father or sister or brother for my sake will regret it because he will receive 100 fold in this age and in the life to come. What was he supposed to say to his, his volunteers? <laughs> they weren't just tired once in a while. Their lives were on the line. What did he tell those whose families were fed to the lions or had family members killed for their beliefs? What was Jesus saying? He says, you're not crazy if you follow me with all your heart. All your heart. And people like me and people like you need to look at each other in the eye every now and then and say, you're not crazy. There's a couple of you I'd have to lie, but that's okay. <laughs> We need to tell our children's ministry people that the child that you're holding might just be a critical player in world redemption someday. They could be the next Billy Graham. They could be the next Pastor Tim or Rick Cordozo. We have to tell our ushers and greeters, our parking posse people, that people's first impressions of New Hope Church might make the difference between them coming to know the Lord and eternity with Jesus or turning around and walking back out into that dark world they just walked in out of. Our tech teams and, and praise and worship people need to know that the next song they do might mark someone's heart for eternity. You're not crazy. So volunteers, I want you to hear it from me today. You are not crazy. You'll thank God for all eternity that you left the stands you got on the field and gave your all for him. And he deserves nothing less. But also know your sacrifice is appreciated by us, your teammates. And I say that on behalf of the pastoral staff, the ministry leaders, everybody that's involved here who asks for help. We appreciate the help that you offer for laboring alongside us. So I, I just want to close today by sharing a little bit of a story from Max Lucado and his thoughts on a familiar scripture. John 12, verses 1 to 11. You know the story. Lazarus' resurrection. Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. All played different positions. They loved God. They got along with each other. They wanted to serve Jesus. But because they played different positions, they went about serving in different ways. Martha was the tireless servant. Mary was a total worshiper. Lazarus had a powerful testimony to share. 
They were like family to Jesus. And after he raised Lazarus from the dead, they decided to have a dinner party to honor Jesus. They didn't try to outdo each other, but all three worked together for one purpose. Martha served. She made sure that the pieces were all in place so the event was a success. Mary worshipped. She anointed the Lord's feet with an extravagant gift and that aroma that just kind of filled the room they were in. Yeah, I know, Martha thought Mary should be in the kitchen working with her, but that's a different story, okay? <laughs> Lazarus, boy, did he have a story to tell, and he was ready to share it. Three people, different gifts, different abilities, equal value to the Lord. All three were needed, much like our spiritual family here. Every church needs Martha's. Her sleeves rolled up, ready to serve. They're the pace setters. Because of Martha's, Lucato writes, the room is set up, the lights and sound are on, the AC is working, and the sign-up sheets are in the right place. <laughs> you know, sometimes you don't miss Martha until Martha is missing. <laughs> Everyone's scrambling around then, trying to find things, wondering what went wrong and how to fix it. Martha's always have that mission. Meanwhile, Mary sits at Jesus' feet, worshiping and inspiring others to worship pouring out her most precious gift to her Lord. The fragrance fills that house like praise fills this room this morning. And just like there's a place for sacrificial service, there's always a place for extravagant praise. It's been said that Mary's have one foot in heaven and the other foot on a cloud. <laughs> we need Mary's because sometimes we get so busy we can forget how important Worship and praise is to the Lord. But they don't. They're good at it. Lazarus, on the other hand, had a different assignment at the dinner. His was outside with the crowd. John chapter 12, verse 9 says he had a testimony to share and a message to communicate that would point people to Jesus. God used him mightily. God wants us all to proclaim his love and his hope. We're all ministers of the gospel. If you have the Holy Spirit in your heart, if you have given yourself to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are a minister of the gospel. One way or another. Some people speak it, other people act it out, but everybody's a minister. Laz, he specialized in testifying, but he also served and worshiped. Martha specialized in service but she also worshipped and testified. Mary specialized in worship, but she also testified and served. And that's a portrait of what we should be, all on the same team. They found their position with one exception. There was another character in this story, Judas. And though he spent more time with Jesus, he was a phony. He was in it for what he got out of it. And when Mary poured that beautiful smelling perfume on the feet of Jesus, he got hyper-spiritual. Oh, that could have been sold and the money used to help the poor. He didn't care about the poor. He was a thief. John said it in verse 6. He was a taker. He was a thief. He helped himself to the donations because he was the keeper of the bag or whatever they put it in. I say, like Martha, we need to take time to serve. And like Mary, we need to take time to worship. And like Lazarus, we need to take time to testify. But there are those like Judas who take and take and take. And they don't give back. If you're Martha, be strengthened. God sees your servanthood. If you're Mary, be encouraged. God receives your worship. If you're Lazarus, be strong. God honors your conviction. But if you're Judas, be warned. He sees your selfishness. Don't squander your one and only life. Whatever else you're doing, it isn't as important as serving God and serving others. Now, I just want to take a second to warn you, too. Don't ignore the other responsibilities God has given you. This is a struggle. I don't know how Mark feels about it, how Tim feels about it, how Chris feels about it. I can tell you as a pastor, there have been times when I've asked myself, 
have I given too much time to the church and not enough to my kids or to my wife? He wouldn't ask you to do more than you can do. Keep it in balance, but don't cut him out. Find your position. Play it to the best of your ability before him. Then you can say, I got out of the stands, I got on the field, I got in the game, I found my position, and I did it with all my heart. I left it all on the field. Volunteers, I want to thank you, those of you who, who serve in whatever way it is. And in case you're wondering, yes, if, you just re, if you're just a prayer warrior, quote unquote, just a prayer warrior, it's still an incredible gift back to us. But I want to thank you. I want you to ask you to keep up the good work. Realize, I know that that's not your reward, okay? But it is an acknowledgement of your sacrifice. And those of you who are still seeking your position, keep looking. Just find a place to serve and dive in somewhere. And expect a passion to be ignited once you find it. Let me pray us out of here. Father, I thank you. As a, as a pastor on a staff, I thank you for those who give of themselves because I know it's a sacrifice for all of them, regardless of how it might appear to them or to men about how much of a sacrifice, but I know it's a sacrifice to give of time, to give of energy, and to serve, serving others, because in serving others, we're following your commands and serving you. So I thank you for each of our folks here at New Hope. And Lord, I just pray that the rest of us can be helpful to those who are still seeking a place where they are to serve and help them with the understanding that they, it may not be a place where they think they're gifted. It might be a completely different gift, but you'll lead them there if they just let you. So I thank you for those who serve, those who give, and I look forward to working with the rest who are seeking a position to play. So thank you in the name of our Lord and Savior. Amen. Have a good safari. <laughs>